lameness is kind of only second to respiratory disease in terms of the highest rate of morbidities in our feed yard. So it's something that really we need to, you know, we need to get a handle on and we need to understand at what point those animals need to be euthanized if they're not recovering. Um, it's kind of all part of a package of, of animal health and care and well-being that we have to, that we have to be uh, aware of. Welcome to the Beef Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brandy Buzzard, and it's my pleasure to bring you the trending issues and topics with the best and brightest minds of the beef industry. Today, we are joined by Dr. Karen Schwarzkopf genswein Senior Research Scientist at Agriculture Canada. She has earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Lethbridge and her master's from the University of Regina. She went on to earn her PhD in animal science from the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Today, her research areas focus on pain and stress management associated with routine cattle management procedures, and I am so excited to speak with her today about cattle well-being. This episode has been a long time in the making. We have had to reschedule it more than once, so I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Schwarzkopf Genswein to the show. So thank you for being here. How are you? Thanks, Brandy. I, I'm great. It's, uh, it's February, and it's winter in southern Alberta, which... I guess it could be colder than it is currently. It's minus three Celsius, so that's not too bad. Mm -hmm. We're really uh, low on moisture in this area, so any amount of rain or snow that we get, we are very thankful for. So we don't have a drought yet again this year. <laughs> Your cattle are constantly threatened by the exposure of mycotoxins in feed. Now you can know if mycotoxins are present in your feed and what you should do about it. DSM Firminish offers a range of analytical services to assess the mycotoxin contaminations and solutions to combat those mycotoxins. Don't let mycotoxins contaminate your performance. Visit dsm.com forward slash ANH NA to learn more. At my ranch, we have a saying, I think I'm kind of the only one who abides by it, but I tell my husband, like, we don't complain about mud because <laughs> I have prayed for rain far more than I have ever prayed for it to be dry or anything like that. So it's currently very muddy at our house, but we are very thankful for the moisture. As you said, you know, we were in a drought last year as well. And so we're thankful to have the moisture going now. Yeah, absolutely. No, and the, the predictions for this year aren't, aren't great they are we're you know planning for uh drought conditions and water rationing and that type of thing so any amount we're we're blessed to get it yes absolutely i agree so well to start off with um i read a little a very small amount of your background in our bio so can you tell us more about how you got involved in the beef industry and your career path I'm sure there's a lot more below the surface than what the very short bio that I just read. So if you could just bring us up to speed, please. Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually, I work and I have had most of my career in Lethbridge, uh, Alberta. And that's it's what's amazing about that is I actually grew up and was raised on a farm, family farm and feedlot just 15 uh, kilometers outside of the city of Lethbridge where I work currently. So I guess I'm a little bit of an oddity at our research facility um, where I work as Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada research facility. And it's one of the largest uh, animal research facilities in the, for the federal government um, that exists. And so I have been really lucky to be able to stay in the area. Um, it was really, a, I mean, growing up um, as kids, we were actively a part of the, the feedlot. I mean, we helped uh, all the time. We were engaged in what was happening with the animals and um, just day-to-day -day chores that we had to do. So, you know, that the love of the industry and working with the people in the industry just comes naturally, right? It, it was a natural progression of, I didn't marry a farmer, so to, and able to, to be able to stay in this, uh, in agriculture, I mean, it was just the natural progression. I did a bachelor's degree, as you said, in, in it was in biology, actually, and so was my master's degree. And 
after doing that, I realized that I really missed um, livestock and animal science. And so that's why I did my PhD in that area at the vet school in Saskatoon. And I, I uh, was able to come back to Lethbridge, Lethbridge to do a postdoc. And then uh, slowly I worked as a feedlot specialist for the provincial government. And then I got my current position. So I've been in that position for 26 years now. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. What a blessing to be able to work near where you lit, you know, where you grew up in your family. So often yeah. it seems like, you know, our careers take us across the country and we have to put down roots in other areas. And so, That's you know, true. that must be a, a real true blessing for you. No, absolutely. Like I, um, when I tell people that actually, when my PhD supervisor asked me, you know, what are, where do you want to work after you're finished? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to Lethbridge. My goal is to get a, a job there as a scientist. And um, he looked at me and said, Karen, you, you know that doesn't happen very often. <laughs> and I said, well, no, I, I am sure I can do it. But I mean, it took a few years and I understand now why he said what he did. But yeah, when I kind of look across at that research facility, there, there might be one other scientist out of 45 that actually grew up in the area. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I love that story. <laughs> I, so I noticed while I was preparing for this episode that you are the lead on a research project there for the most common causes of lameness in cattle out of, you know, the 45 people there. So, um, I just love to know more about that. I, I, my master's is in animal well-being, and I did some of my research on cattle. So I, I particularly love talking about pain management, animal well-being and things of that nature. So can you share a bit about maybe some of your research you're doing and, and maybe a bit what some of those most common causes of lameness are? Sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, so actually, when I first started to when I first put in for funding uh, to do some work in the area of lameness, I, I think I probably put in the grant four times, maybe, <laughs> maybe oh. more. <laughs> and every time I put it in, um, it came back saying, well, you know, lameness is not an issue for feedlot cattle. That's a dairy issue. And I, I was, I was shocked, but I said, okay, yeah. well, you know, I, maybe I, maybe I don't fully understand what some of the issues are. So I did, a, I went to um, some local feedlots around our area where we exist in, it's called Feedlot Alley. And that's, okay. you, you drive a couple miles, there's another feedlot, another feedlot, we're just in the middle of it. So it's very easy to go and work with the commercial people. And so I, I asked a couple of commercial feedlots if I could come in and just take a look at, you know, issues in their chronic pens and so on. And um, lo and behold, when I did that, uh, what's in those chronic pens? This is not a surprise. If you look there, the, the animals <laughs> are there and typically are, many of them are lame. And actually the ones that I looked at at the time, they were between 30 and 50% um, of the issues there were lameness. So 50%. Wow. Yeah. And you know, that that's in the chronic pen. So understand that's where usually, um, you know, the, the animals that take longer to recover, typically have, you know, foot issues or lameness issues as well. And so um, it wasn't a surprise, I guess, when I started to do that. It was good to confirm to myself what I was thinking. And um, when I presented some of that information, I made an abstract based on the little study, preliminary study that I did. And I showed the, the industry, like, you know, this is, this is true. It's what's happening. And, you know, to, to varying degrees. I mean, it's going to vary. It does vary by feedlot, of course. Um, and then, yeah, they, they were... They looked and thought, yeah, we need to take a, a bigger look into this. So um, I was successful in getting some funding to look at just even characterizing what what types of lameness did we see? What, are, what were the most common types of lameness? Just even starting there to do some benchmarking work. And again, this won't come as a surprise to anybody, but foot rot is the main when we're looking at hoof-related 
uh, lameness and infectious lameness. Foot rot is the top one. Um, mm-hmm. And then more and more we're seeing uh, in our feedlots at least, um, digital dermatitis, which is a common um, infectious lameness in the dairy industry. Um, and now we're starting to see that it increase in um, some of our Canadian feedlots. And then another one called uh, toe tip necrosis syndrome. So um, we see it in early when the calves receiving calves come in and typically what they're very flighty. And so um, if they come up onto a, ra- a loading ramp or any kind of rough surface, they can abrade their toe tip, which and that okay. allowed white line, the white line separation and bacteria gets in there and then it, it closes and it prov- provides a very nice anaerobic um, uh, place for those bacteria to grow. And so then we see these, uh, that bacteria can go to the point that it, it, it travels up the, the leg and kind of can liquefy even or deteriorate the P3 bone. So we see that um, more and more, if, if you really look, you see more of those. Um, often happens when those, when those calves come off of like a wet pasture, so the, the hooves are quite soft and that mm-hmm. can happen more frequently. And it, like I said, it tends to happen with more flighty animals so that you know um, high temperament animals that are running uh, all the time or run quickly on slippery surfaces and, that can cause uh, that abrasion of the, the toe tip. So those are kind of the main ones also that we've looked at and uh, try to find mitigation strategies around them. It was interesting that at the time we started that work, there really wasn't a lot of uh, work done on, you know, A, characterizing lameness, and then B, kind of mitigation strategies around it. So. I think since that time, there, there has been more studies done in, in Canada and the U.S. and in Europe. Um, but I still think it's an area where, you know, needs a lot more attention. Actually, lameness is kind of only second to respiratory disease in terms of the highest rate of morbidities in our feed yard. So mm-hmm. it's something that really we need to, you know, we need to get a handle on and we need to understand at what point those animals need to be euthanized if they're not recovering. Um, it's kind of all part of a package of, of animal health and care and well-being that we have to, that we have to be uh, aware of. That's interesting. Um, I, I think if we had to, you know, I don't work in a feedlot, but I, I'm guessing that it's probably similar to what we have down here in the United States with the number one being respiratory, mm-hmm. number two probably being that lameness as well. I want to rewind back, though, to the dermatitis thing and uh, what you, was it digital dermatitis? Is that what you Digital what dermatitis, was? yeah. So it's usually, you said it's it's primarily seen in dairy cattle, but it's starting to show up in your in beef feedlots now. Is that is our, is that showing up on beef time, beef dairy crossbred cattle or is that something that's just you know can you tell us more about that and also i have never heard of it so could you talk a bit more about it in general yeah so digital dermatitis is um an infectious lameness caused by treponine bacteria and those bacteria can live once once they exist in a pen they're very difficult to get rid of um the the biggest things that have worked in terms of mitigation are um, uh, scraping the pens. There are topical uh, uh, mitigation strategies that are used. So, or a foot bath, um, those are strategies commonly used in the dairy industry. So in the feedlot, they don't work as well, um, obviously, and especially in our Northern climates where, you know, uh, a big part of the year can be, uh, you know, frozen frozen foot baths, so it doesn't tend to work as well. Right. We, yeah. We hypothesize that that digital dermatitis likely came in from dairy animals that we feed. Uh, we some feedlots feed pure Holsteins and also the crosses, dairy beef crosses. So we don't know for sure. That is our speculation. It's very hard at this stage to know, I mean, once it's in, like, where exactly did it come from? Right. I think that's true. And it seems that the feedlots that did have 
um, that had dairy cattle in, in their yards also see digital dermatitis um, more predominantly, but we really don't know. And nobody's been able to kind of do the work to say that's really where it came from. But it's, it's, a, it's a good guess, I would say at this stage. Yeah, is it, does it spread really easily? Yes, it does. And it's very, you know, once you have it in a pen, um, it's, it, and it, it's very, very, diff it's very painful. And they, uh, you know, there's different stages of digital dermatitis. So there's from the initial stage and M, it's called the M stage scoring that when you look at the lesions, um, it goes from M, M0, which is nothing to an M1. M2 is the the uh, very sore kind of um, active stage of the lesion. And they call it strawberry heel as well, because if you look, you can oh. see at the back of the heel bulb, it's very obvious and it's a bright red lesion that you can see. And it's, it's very painful for them. And it can go into a chronic stage where, again, it just never, it, it just keeps cycling through those M stages um, from a 4.1 and, and then to a two again. So it, it's very difficult once it gets into the chronic stages to get rid of, but um, we are looking at different mitigation strategies around that again, looking at what is the best topical applications and also systemic uh, applications. It's been thought in the past that antimicrobials don't work on uh, digital dermatitis, but we we really we really don't know um, much about how you know the mechanism. I mean, it's systemic, but why doesn't it get into the into the heel bulb? Uh, that doesn't make sense to us. Why a systemic mm -hmm. antibiotic couldn't do that? So we are looking at some of those strategies, and we're just in the middle of kind of tying up some of that work now. So um, some of that work will be published within the next couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess I, I had, I knew what dermatitis was and I know what digital means, but I had just never heard of that affecting cattle. That's unfortunate to hear that it's, it, it kind of reminds me on the pig side of things, um, kind of like with PERS, you know, once you kind of have PERS in a farm, it's very hard to it's hard. get rid of it. And, and similar, like with it, you know, in, in a beef cattle related analogy, like anaplasmosis, like once you have that in your herd you have yeah. it like you kind of have to accept it so that's unfortunate to hear that it's so painful and it's just so hard to to manage yeah can be for sure yeah in terms of like your research with pain mitigation in cattle i mean have there been any surprises like what's the biggest surprise or that you've uncovered or learned during all these you know 26 years i believe you said that you've been there you know researching pain mitigation and lameness yeah, so um, most of the, the pain work that I've done has been related to uh, painful management procedures like castration, some on dehorning, um, a little bit on spaying, and also on branding. So I actually did my PhD looking at different methods of branding and to see which one was, was least painful. And after all this time, what what is very striking is that individual animal responses to pain and being able to, it, it's difficult to measure pain in humans let alone animals that can't talk and tell us you know what they're feeling right so how to appropriately assess pain and to know if a mitigation strategy is working so that's a it's tough and we use the combination of behavioral and physiological measures i think that's the best the combination of those two is gives us the most complete picture of what that animal is telling us um, because one or other on their own sometimes can be a little bit misleading. There's lots of controversy now um, as to our limited ability in, for, me, for measuring pain and um, mitigating pain because until you can actually really measure some of those things very accurately and consistently and using validated techniques and methodologies that, you know, um, it's hard to, to say absolutely that one, um, that A, this is painful in this way and B, that you can mitigate that pain. So I would say if we have any work to do and, and 
I would thought I would have thought after all of this time we would have a better handle on how to measure it properly. But as we as with any science, I mean, we we get better and better, and we get get new methods and new techniques, and you know, um, science moves forward, and we're able to look at maybe different biomarkers. Uh, maybe we are, we have a better way of uh, objectively of uh, looking at the behavior of the animal whether that's the use of AI techniques or something. So I think we will get better at it, but um, I guess the surprise to me is that, you know, we haven't done a better job of validating those things and, and having it. We have a toolkit that we use, but if you look at the studies that have been done, it's very difficult. They're inconsistent because the factors like animal age, um, the, the, method of administration of the drug, the type of drug, uh, the, you know, the drug onset, the, uh, the breed of the animal, the um, managing all of those factors um, and having it consistent between studies, it, it just hasn't happened. So I think, you know, when you look kind of across a body of work, the the results are a little bit all over the place. Sometimes this marker will show that it's painful. Sometimes this one will, and that one won't. So it's it's it can be very difficult, and interpretation around it can be very difficult. I mean, I guess that's why it's research is because yeah. there's you learn something new every time. You um, before I move on, I have a related question, but. You mentioned that you've done a lot of research on castration, and I just recently learned about a new castration um, ban in terms of pain mitigation. And have you heard of the Lido bands? Yes, absolutely. It's a Canadian company that's actually making them. And lo and behold, it's not registered for use in Canada yet. Um, really? But yeah, so, but absolutely, like these are the things that will push our industry forward. So, um, the fact that, again, great idea, it's, you know, the lidocaine within those bands is absorbed transdermally and it provides um, long-term uh, anal analgesia or anesthesia, should I say, to that area. And that's been one of the, the issues that we've had for pain control is that there's two, you know, you have to control the procedural pain. So the initial pain, if it's knife or surgical castration, the actual cutting uh, of the skin, that's that's the procedural pain. And then there's the post-operative pain. So, you know, for the knife castration animals, it seems to be shorter lived, uh, more acute, but shorter lived. And the banded animals, less acute, but longer term. So how do you mitigate pain in both for the procedure and longer term? And so, again, uh, a lot of the research is showing that you use what is called the multimodal approach. Uh, Dr. Hans Kotzi um, has done a lot of work in that area, and we've worked with him. And, uh, you know, it's very, it's, it's quite obvious that you need both. You need the anesthesia to provide kind of shorter term, uh, quicker onset pain control, and then the analgesics provide uh, inflammation um, control and reduce pain in that way. And so when you combine those drugs, it provides kind of the longest coverage, but it's still none of them are perfect, right? So they have uh, a duration of action. Um, I think the longest one we have re registered in Canada is meloxicam. The U.S. doesn't have that registered currently, which is a a, a bit of an issue, um, but you know, up to two days post administration, it, it can cover. But it also means we know that band castration causes pain longer than the two-day period. And in fact, right, what we did see, and we were actually surprised. I think we were the first uh, group that actually showed that because we followed them until the testicles fell off and beyond. And what we saw is at the time that the the band broke through the skin and the testicles fell off. If you look to see above the band is very inflamed and then it leaves a, you know, an open kind of wound where, where the testicles have fallen off. And in that it can, it got infected. And we saw at about that three week period when it was happening, 
that the animals went off feed and, you know, average daily gain was lower for that couple weeks. And so there again, you have pain and how do you pr provide uh, pain control over that length of time, right? right. So, you know, those are things that we need to kind of uh, get a better handle on. Um, to know, I mean, depending on the procedure, the, the pain is going to, to differ. It again differs by age, it differs by how the administration of the drug is very important to the, the route of administration. So for example, oral meloxicam has a, a, a much longer um, duration of effect than if it's injected. So, you know, you got you have to know what you're doing and and know when that drug has its effect and when if it, the pain lasts longer, depending on what you're doing, how do you cover the whole time? Have we been great at covering the entire um, period of pain? Uh, I would say no, we haven't done well at that, but that's kind of our goal in the end. If we can control both procedural and post-operative pain for as long as it's it's lasting. But the lidocaine band is for sure, um, it's, it's great because it's offering uh, pain control for a much longer period of time than it would normally ever uh, uh, occur as an injectable or just placed topically because it's slowly released from, from the band, right? Right, I just learned about it a couple months ago and uh, I thought as soon as I saw it, I was so excited about it and thought it was a fabulous yeah. development. I knew it was a Canadian company. I didn't realize it wasn't approved in Canada yet. So hopefully that's... I, I think they're working on that now and yeah. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you can have that available up there um, soon. Cause I know that I have some friends um, down here in the States, like one particular in Ohio who's using it. And so, yeah, I think, I think it's just fabulous. Um, a, a friend of mine from K-State where I went to school uh, is, is worked on it. And yeah, I think I was just so excited to learn about it. And a fun fact, you mentioned Dr. Han, um, Dr. Hans Kotzia. Uh, Kotzia, I uh, worked with him on my master's in the cattle work that I did do. I was part of a very, very small part of a, a project that he was, that he was conducting of pain management and feedlot cattle. So yeah, that's a, a fun. I mean, and I, he's, he's the expert in the area for sure. And, and has done so much um, to move that Part of science forward and we we've been happy to lucky and happy to work with him so he's been a, a great advocate for using pain control in the industry and what needs to be done and all it's, you can do the science but then it also comes down to what the your kind of regulations for use of those products are and so on as we know so there's m multiple steps to providing that that pain control and having it available for our producers and animals, yeah. Yeah, and it's nice I mean, if using the Lido band as an example, like that's easy to implement, right? It's, you're already doing that. You're just, tr you just trade out the band you're using. And so I think that that's an important that when it comes to pain mitigation or health strategies, like it needs to be effective, but also needs to, it's, it's highly desirable for it to be easy to implement, you know, and not an additional step or something like that. So I think the Lido band fits that that very well those key pieces of it absolutely in fact that you know i mean i i talked about the multimodal drug approach where you know if i mean if you give an anesthetic you have to have to have that on board for the you know procedure you need to give that drug depending on what it is 15 or 20 minutes before some take longer some take less but then that means handling those cattle twice. And when you do that, as we know, producers aren't too keen on it, right? Or, you know, they may right. rush it so that, you know, the, it's not fully, drug onset is not fully there when they go to do the procedure. So, you know, there's lots of issues around that. Not to say, I mean, in the end, you know, we try and make, give the best solutions we can for our producers, but, you know, in the end, uh, I, it may not be convenient, but it may be something that, you know, we, we have to do regardless of inconvenience mm -hmm. or not, uh, just to make sure we have con pain control in our animals. We wouldn't, we would never think of castrating a dog or a cat or pets without that pain control, right? So I think we have to think similarly and not, not just us in the industry, but I mean, obviously it's the co consumers who speak um, and 
if they know anything about agriculture or even if they don't it's it's it, it's another challenge but to understand you know that it that it should be done i mean they, they wouldn't consider that it shouldn't be done so absolutely yes ab absolutely um so we're kind of talking about the the time that has happened and like breakthroughs and pain management so we've talked about the past a little bit you know what do you see on the horizon for cattle pain management maybe five years down the road or 10 years do you see any big breakthroughs well i think it's going to come down to you know what combinations of drugs um you know kind of the best combinations of drugs that we can use and that can be applied kind of in a single application whether it's so you, you don't have to handle animals more because that's in itself can cause issues or injuries so we want to minimize that so again a couple of things first of all we have to have kind of these validated methods and new methods whether they're with artificial intelligence and looking at the behavior so we can accurately and consistently measure some of those responses and use it as a way to determine whether we the efficacy of a drug whether we've mitigated it or, or not and that will come with again new new um, ways of measuring and then these new technologies where again the lidocaine ban is a good one um, it's, this is not a new technology, but it depends in certain countries. It's it's still not available or not adopted, and that's the anti-GnRH vaccines for for castration. And so, to me, I mean, we've done a little bit of work with that, and we've made the comparison between those animals injected with the anti-GnRH vaccine uh, and those that were not, and to look at the welfare. And really, there were no issues that we saw with in you know, vaccinating those animals. Um, to me, it is a solution for the industry. Uh, we, the company that, the companies that create those vaccines are not, um, haven't registered those products for use in Canada, but I'm not sure about the US, I think they have. And I'm not sure about the uptake of that. I know it's, it's very common in the pig industry, not so much in the beef industry. And I, I, I don't have a good answer for why. Um, I think people think it's a steroid or it's a hormone and they don't want hormone in their, their meat, but that's, that's not true and people don't understand that. So I, I think it's also a marketing issue. Yeah, that is a constant, you know, on my side of things, I have the science background, but I, I don't really use my science background very much, but I use communication more for those discussions with grocery shoppers and you know that added hormones and beef discussion is, is always it's can be contentious because people are passionate about where their food comes from and passionate about animals being taken care of as are we the ones that are caring for the animals so it's a it's definitely a um a pinch point i guess uh when we come to those conversations yes um if you could give ranchers one you know you have this near you know three decades of experience in cattle pain management and and research if you could give ranchers a piece of advice pertaining to pain management you know on the ranch with or the farm with their cattle you know what would that what would you say that one key piece of advice would be yeah well first of all uh acknowledge that animal that our calves no matter how small um feel pain they experience pain. That's that's not a question anymore. Um, I'm still shocked by some people, some people in the industry telling me, well, I, animals don't really, I don't think they feel pain. So we have to, we have to forget that comment because I think you know, it, logically it, it, it doesn't even make sense. Um, biologically and adaptively, it doesn't make sense. So, um, first of all acknowledge that they experience pain and that pain is experienced as young as you can do any procedure so we we have done some work on looking at the effect of age on um, pain and particularly castic castration so we've always advocated that you do the procedure as early as possible so as mm -hmm. close to birth yes. as possible as you can and um you know, thinking a, a lot of people said, well, you know, at that young age, they really don't experience pain. And we know from the human research with 
um, uh, circumcision, their circumcision in, in, in babies. We know because of that, you know, a lot of those procedures were, were done without pain management, right? And so oh, it, with the same reasoning that, ah, you know, babies don't feel pain. They're too young. They don't, they can't experience it. And maybe they don't remember it. But, but they still experience they it. They still experience it. But you're right. The the mindset that that they're not, they don't feel young, pain when they're young, but they only develop that when they're older. You know, that's they they respond. They have a pain response. It is different than older cattle. And again, it makes sense to do the procedures earlier because the tissue is not as developed. If you think in the case of castration. The tissue is not um, the the size and the innervation of that area is smaller, and so the complications around it, the pain around it, is is believed to be less. And we have evidence of that, as you as you know, if you castrate the older the animals are when you castrate them, them the larger the impact on um, performance and all of those things. And physiologically, we can measure that response is, is substantially greater. So that we still advocate that it be done early, but it does mm -hmm. not mean it shouldn't be done without pain control. So if, if I have to tell producers, it's to do it early, but also use pain management too. And if you can use nothing else, if you don't want to give it, you know, the multimodal, um, both the anesthetic and the, the analgesic, at least give the analgesic. Yeah. So the piece of advice, producers, if you're listening, or those who are listening, is to castrate as early as you can, and, and the an analgesic, that is your advice. Um, okay, well, a little bit of a pivot here. We've talked a lot about what you've done in your professional career and what you see on the horizon, but when you're not doing research or working with cattle, what else do you fill your time with? <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I live in a rural area, and so we are always um, involved in uh, things. Either on my my through over the years, children's activities, uh, you know, farm activities. As a scientist with travel and um, all kinds of other things going on. Your downtime is <laughs> typically short. So, yes, um, yeah. you know, we, we enjoy lots of times. I honestly, I just enjoy being able to stay home and do things around my own home and, and yard and with my own animals and my own family. And because you often don't get the big periods of time to do that. So, um, we have a cabin actually in Idaho, Sandpoint, Idaho area, and oh. we frequently go there and enjoy enjoy our walking, hiking, biking, that type of thing. So, uh, reading, yeah. Well, those all sound lovely. Being outdoors, at home, spending time with your family, those all sound like great things to do. I agree. It's time for our famous three. Um, so we come to the part of our podcast where we ask the same questions of every guest. And so I gave you a heads up on these. I don't ever like to spring them on people without telling them. But so those, the first one is, what is your favorite beef or cattle related book or resource? So it doesn't have to be a book. It could be a website. I actually, for the first time ever had a guest say it was a, their favorite beef cattle per, resource was a person. So that wasn't one I was looking I was expecting. So you get the you get the idea here. That's a good. That's a really great. Um, so as a resource, like I don't can't say that. I mean, a, a, a beef book. No. Um, as a resource, though, I I frequently use um, our Beef Cattle Research Council has a great website, and often if you know, I I go on there to see they put. Anybody that, whose research that they funded, they've put they put their work on and what they found, and it's very little nice snippets for you know industry if you want to get some quick information. But I like to go there because other areas of research that I am not involved in and don't do, that's a great resource for me too. Because then, mm -hmm. uh, and it's you know it's simple, it's easy, 
easy to access and you know who the people are so you can uh, quickly look at what's been done. And I really go there and get ideas from other projects too, to see, you know, what are the synergies between projects? Um, what are, what things are new in areas that I'm not up on, uh, mm -hmm. like pain control or nutrition and, and um, molecular biology areas, immunology, that kind of thing. I often go there. Okay, so the next question is, what is a book not related to the beef industry that you are currently reading or a favorite book? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I'm not gonna say I have a favorite book. I have a favorite author. And I like, um, again, it's com something completely different from animal science, but uh, Tammy Hogue, she's kind of a, a murder mystery thrill thriller ah. type writer. And I really enjoy her books, yeah. It takes you <laughs> completely in a different er uh, direction, but, uh, and I like all of her books, so I think I've read most of them. Yeah. Well, that's great. It's good to get outside of the norm, like, to branch out. It's good. It's good. Right. Okay. And then, so the last question is, what is a trait of someone that you look up to or admire that has enabled that person to be successful? There's a few. I mean, obviously hard work is is a big one. I think you mm -hmm. you can't make any progress in anything that you do without hard work, no matter, you know, it's a passion and but you need to put in the work to 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 do well at it and to um guide other people. And so hard work is one. I think um being humble is another, doing all this, you know, being when people, you know, at, say, you know, you're an expert in this area. Well, I really don't feel like an expert because there's so much that I don't know. And I just think it's a, it's a trait that, you know, more, more people could, um, could have. And uh, the other thing is just resilience of being able to, you know, kind of go with the flow. And when things don't go well, you kind of step up again and, and try again. And especially as in research, um, as I told you before, um, and especially with animal welfare research, um, you know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to get money. It wasn't easy to convince the industry that this was something. When I started, you can imagine things are, it's, it's tough to have these conversations now. Yeah. Not, move yourself 30 years ago. And when I first, you know, put projects in for, into the industry, I mean, they thought animal welfare was A, the boogeyman, and B, it was like a soft science. It wasn't useful. What were you going to do with it? So you had to have a very thick skin and still do sometimes with, you know, what people think of these things and what they believe. And so... I've just been happy to work with the industry along with that. I think we've made great strides over that 30 year period because what it was like then and what it's like now is, is quite different and people are aware. And I think we've done lots of good work to show that it has great value and needs and is really part of the sustainability for the industry. Oh, I absolutely agree with pretty much all of that. Yeah, I remember when I was in grad school and which was you were already well established in your career and working in it, you know, and experience these challenges, but it was a very small, you know, not many programs in the United States. And now those programs have really expanded and there's more opportunities in that. So that's really nice to see. But I think that you're absolutely right that it was, you know, not re regarded as a kind of on, almost an optional thing. And so uh -huh. I'm glad that it's more of a, this is a requirement for us to take into account. And I, I agree with the sustainability thing, uh, the aspect of it as well, because I, um, I think that uh, I was talking to some professionals from the University of Colorado in the Ag Next program. So my master's professor, Dr. Lily Edward Calloway, yes. she's my major for my master's, and then Kim Stockhouse, Kim Stackhouse Lawson, PhD, yes. who does um, sustainability work. And I think it's just fascinating where, how those two methods of, uh, or mediums of, in, of research, how they interact with each other and how you affect one thing and how that affects the other. And it's just like little levers and things. And I find that tremendously, in, um, just really intriguing. If I ever were to get my PhD, 
it would absolutely be on a sustainability and welfare project and how they really affect each other because you can't really have one without the other. So, uh, exactly, exactly that, 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 I think that's the missing piece because when we talk about welfare, you're really talking about what, what is a stressor for an animal, right? Whether it's, a uh, stress unto itself or if it's a result of pain and those things impact everything impact performance impact um uh illness uh, cortisol produced by stress and other uh, stress hormones are immunosuppressors so that gets to the whole point about you know now we have to mass medicate animals coming into the feedlot that links to antimicrobial resistance that leads to antimicrobial use that we want to limp uh limit you know so all of those things fit together um animals that take longer to finish because they are they have been sick at some point um create more greenhouse gases, those types of things. So there's no aspect of production that that doesn't affect. And I think people often didn't think of it like that. Oh yeah, I, I mean, there's no reason for me to try to say it because you just, you summed it up perfectly there. Everything you said there is just, it is right on the, the button. Um, sadly, that is all the time and the questions I have for today. Well, I have lots more questions, but that is all the time <laughs> that we have for today. Um, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Schwarzkopf Grenswein for joining us today. It, like I said, it was, uh, our audience doesn't know this. It was a long time in the making for us to get this episode, um, scheduled and finished, but, um, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your expertise and your research, um, knowledge and also your foresight into the future and what you think is coming down the track. I, I really appreciate that. Um, if people want to find more about your research or you, where they, I, I have the Beef Research, Cattle Research Council, which is, um, I was able to look it up, it is beefresearch.ca, that specific website. Um, if there's other places that they, people would like to go to learn more about you or um, your work, where else can they go besides that Beef Cattle Research Council? The Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, okay. If you type in my name and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, there's a scientist profile for every scientist that works within the federal government. And so okay. you'll, have, you'll have my contact and publications listed there as well. Yeah. Okay. I'm Googling that and typing that in so that people can find that on the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada website. So, well, thank you very much again for, for joining us today. We really, I appreciate your time and your generosity of sharing your knowledge with us. And I um, hope that we our paths cross in the future. I don't necessarily wanna to come to Alberta in February, but maybe in some other capacity, our paths will cross. So thank you for joining us um, on the podcast and to our audience, thanks for tuning in. And we hope that you will join us again next week on the Beef Podcast.